What does it mean to dedicate your life to someone? To owe someone your life? These are the questions that Oda gets us to consider when introducing the next member of the Straw Hat crew, Sanji. And in typical Oda fashion, he doesn't just get us to consider these questions through only Sanji, but from the point of view of Don Krieg's battle commander, Gin. Oh, and Luffy's here as well. So let us return to the Baradier to consider the most important question of them all. What is the point of East Blue? Let's talk about our boy Sanji. In his introduction, it's easy to get swept up in his outward-facing traits. His foul mouth, his cool demeanor, his hatred of wasting food, and his... Uh... Love of women. But I noticed something with Sanji's intro chapter. We don't see him cook. In Usopp's introductory chapter, we see him tell tall tales and confront pirates, albeit Luffy and the crew, to protect his village. In Nami's, we see her intelligence and weather savviness, and her stealing from and deceiving pirates. In Zoro's, we see him honorably taking punishment because he believed Helmeppo's word. These are all core components of these characters. But with Sanji, we never see him cook. Instead, in his opening chapter, his opening panel, he is serving food. Even in his next chapter, we see him serving the rice to Gin. We don't see him cooking it. I think this is Oda setting us up for something that will become clear through this arc, that Sanji at this point in the story is living his life serving others, and more specifically in service to Zeph. We learn why with Sanji's flashback. Zeph saved his life, twice. First by saving Sanji from drowning, then by sacrificing his legs so that Sanji had food to eat. Sanji realizes the enormity of this sacrifice, and from that moment on, he has his life revolve around Zeph. So, with that context in mind, Sanji's introductory arc is as follows. It is the story of a man who has resolved himself to dedicate his life to someone else, and the start of his journey to learn that his own life has value. Every part of this arc is about Sanji. Even Zoro's life-defining duel against Mihawk has ramifications in the story of Sanji. Though no part better complements Sanji's story than Don Krieg's battle command again. Unlike Sanji, where we learn why he's so dedicated to Zeph, with Gin, we're not actually sure why he's dedicated his life to Don Krieg. Gin describes it himself as admiration, and I guess that's good enough for us. You don't have to dedicate your life to someone just because they saved yours, you can also do it because you admire them. But both Sanji and Gin start this arc at the same point. They are both willing to sacrifice themselves for the person they serve. Gin will use himself as bait to protect Krieg, and is more than willing to die for Krieg if Krieg says so. Sanji too, when Zeph's life is at risk, he is willing to be beaten to death for Zeph. So let's circle back to the beginning, and talk about Luffy. Yes, he's the last of the trio I said I would cover this video. We're talking about why he wants to recruit Sanji, and I think this time it's the most obvious. And we also get a good example of what Luffy's not looking for. It's this scene when Gin first makes an appearance and asks for food, and when Patty asks if he can pay and then gets threatened, Patty beats him down. Luffy's initial reaction is acknowledging that Patty is strong. However, when it becomes obvious that Gin is starving, Luffy looks on unimpressed, even as the rest of the restaurant's clientele cheer. I said it with Zoro and I'll say it again here, Luffy is not looking for strong people. It's a nice bonus, but it's never his criteria for crew members. It's when Sanji gives Gin a plate of food, not asking for anything in return, just telling Gin to eat, smiling when Gin thanks him, that's when Luffy decides that he's found his cook. And this scene is important. We see Sanji's selfless kindness, when previously we saw his rough attitude towards full body. This kindness of Sanji profoundly affects Gin, and we'll see later on in this arc. And Luffy decides to recruit Sanji as the Straw Hat's cook, mind you, without even tasting his food first. We see his classic selfish Luffy attitude when he rejects Sanji's rejection of his invitation, and from Sanji we get the first hint of why he cares about protecting the Baradier so much, because it's Zeph's treasure. That being said, when he's laying the romance on thick with Nami, he does let it slip that he kind of wants to be a pirate, and look how panicked he is when Zeph overhears and understands that Sanji's dedication to Zeph is an obstacle to that. He tries to cover up with, I'll cook here forever, but note the add-on of, until you die. Zeph is what is keeping Sanji on the Baradier. When we get to the pages of Sanji's philosophy, we can also assume with the knowledge of Sanji's backstory that this too is a result of Zeph. 
It may be solely because of his experience of hunger and the same reasoning that Zeph gives when questioned, but I think Sanji's reasoning is that it's because despite Zeph not knowing Sanji, despite Zeph being an apparently bloodthirsty pirate, what they were didn't matter when they were starving. That's why Sanji justifies his decision with, it's my job to feed people, not judge them. Sanji's kicking skills are another thing that he's inherited from Zeph. While Red Shoe Zeph may be no more, he's either taught Sanji directly or indirectly how to fight with his feet. I'm sure the reasoning that Sanji gives is the same reasoning that Zeph has for fighting the same way. We can even assume that Sanji's current arsenal of recipes and cooking skills are inherited from Zeph. When Zeph insults the soup Sanji has made, Sanji asks how Zeph's soup is any different from his. We can extrapolate that that's because this soup is a creation of Zeph's that Sanji has inherited and likely cooked in the exact same way. Even in the final chapter as we see Sanji growing up with Zeph when the two think of their time together, we see why Sanji picked up smoking. Not because Zeph was a smoker or encouraged it, rather he discouraged it, but because a young Sanji thought that starting to smoke made him a bit more of an adult, probably hoping that Zeph would stop treating him like a child. The only thing we can glean from our brief look at a young Sanji is that he dreamed to find the old blue and that he already had an interest in cooking, he was a cook's apprentice. All his other characteristics are thanks either directly or indirectly from Zeph. Even his cool demeanor. Yes, Sanji is a kid in the flashback, but he's so emotive. His desperation, his tears, but years of being with Zeph has caused him to become outwardly more stoic. It's as Zeph says, a man ought to take his leave quietly, and we can assume from that, and how Zeph and Sanji talk to one another, that they internalize their feelings and outwardly show either very little emotion aside from anger. Well, aside from Sanji's love of women, and really we don't get an explanation for that this arc, so I guess I'll throw that into the chest for later? But we can see that from his outbursts with women, the way that he's acted in the past, the way that he is when he talks about the All Blue, and his anger when people waste food, Sanji is full of emotion. He is a passionate man for food, for women, and for his dreams. But as I said at the top, he suppressed his passion, his dream, even his emotions, all for Zeph's sake. Now we can finally get to the start of the change. The very start is when Sanji calls Zoro and Luffy foolish for pursuing the Grand Line, and note his expression when he says it. It's like he's talking to himself here, saying something aloud that he's used to quash his own pursuits. But Zoro agrees with Sanji, saying that he's given himself up for dead in pursuit of following his dream. And Sanji looks frustrated at this, and Zeph looks pleased. Then we quickly get the payoff as Sanji watches Zoro's duel with Mihawk. He sees that Zoro is not all talk and that he really is ready and willing to put his life on the line to pursue his dream. But even then, Sanji is in denial. He lets the truth slip. It's easy. Abandon your stupid dream. Sanji is speaking from experience. He has abandoned his dream. He has dedicated himself to Zeph and so he cannot pursue the all blue but he's being confronted with someone wholeheartedly pursuing their dream right in front of him. Someone who would rather die than give up. Imagine having something you've always wanted to do. Something you were so passionate about, but over time you grow up. You put time towards other things, other priorities. Things that you have to do. That thing you've wanted to do fades into the background and when you think about it, well, it's too late now anyway. And then you see someone who eschews all those things that they quote unquote have to do and they're just wholeheartedly pursuing their passion. It's easy to call them stupid, foolish, not doing the smart thing, but could you help but think, well, what if I gave it my all? To Sanji, Zoro is that guy, recklessly pursuing his dream even when he is completely and utterly outclassed by Mihawk. Zoro calls out to his captain and promises to try again. Sanji sees it. He sees it all, and to me, he looks not just relieved that Zoro has survived, but also captivated. He's reminded of what it means to want something so badly, to be so desperate to pursue it, that you'd foolishly go against someone far stronger than you to make it happen. And the live action stuffs this up. I'm not going to repeat myself, watch my issues with the One Piece live action video if you haven't seen it, but they don't have Sanji witness Zoro's duel. Ugh. Though, just because Sanji is being confronted with someone pursuing a dream, that doesn't mean that he's instantly turned around. No, he's still dedicated to Zeph, 
and we see how damaging this dedication is to Sanji as he endures a terrible beating by Pearl. I've intentionally not mentioned Pearl at all. He's probably hands down my least favorite character in One Piece. He exists to show that Sanji is tough and Sanji's ideals as a cook, the importance of a cook's tools, and that he doesn't fear flame as a cook, which I guess I'll throw in the chest. That's all the mention that Pearl is going to get. Sanji endures his beating because Zeph is being held hostage by Gin, who, still deeply moved by Sanji's kindness towards him, is only holding Zeph hostage in order to force Sanji and the rest of the cooks to evacuate. Zeph's life, let alone the other cooks, are not in danger, assuming they do as Gin says. But Sanji's dedication to Zeph is so strong, it's not that he only cares about Zeph's life, but as previously mentioned, the ship, since it's Zeph's treasure. We get an interesting contrast. During Zoro's duel, Sanji says, it's easy, abandon your stupid dream. But when Sanji refuses to back down, Gin says something similar to him. It's easy, leave the ship and you'll all be spared. The twisted difference is that Zoro is willing to die for his dream, for his promise, for his honor. But Sanji, it's all for the ship. It's played as a cool moment, but it's so tragic. He's doing it so that for one moment longer, this place can remain a restaurant. He's acknowledging that his actions aren't going to stop anything. He's implicitly stating that Krieg will succeed in taking the ship. In his mind, his debt and dedication to Zeph are so large that his life isn't even worth a life, but it's only worth a few moments of a thing existing. Now that I write that, it makes me think of Krieg's obsession with his things. Maybe there's a connection, maybe not. Either way, the first reaction we get to this is Luffy. And as Sanji endures, Luffy is torn. We established back in Syrup Village that Luffy is a selfish jerk, but if he likes you, he will do everything in his power to help you, to do, in his mind, what's best for you. With Sanji, there's a contradiction. Luffy really likes Sanji. He's decided that Sanji is going to be his cook, but Sanji is ready to die to protect Zeph's ship. But Luffy understands that that's no way to live. So Luffy's solution? Destroy the ship. We see him agonize over this decision. If Luffy ever had a thought bubble, I reckon it'd go like this. Why is this idiot dying for a ship? I mean, what Sanji wants most is to protect the ship. If I destroy the ship, then Sanji won't have to die protecting it, right? Screw it, I'm destroying the ship. And it's understandable. In the same way that Zeph sacrificed a leg to save Sanji, Luffy remembers Shanks sacrificing an arm to save him. Luffy speaking his mind makes script writing easy. He didn't save your life so you could throw it away. Shanks saw something in Luffy and Luffy strives to live up to that expectation. Zeph recognized a shared dream in Sanji, yet Sanji, despite knowing this, doesn't pursue the dream that was the reason that his life was saved in the first place. Luffy recognizes that for someone to sacrifice something for you, if you are to die meaninglessly, then their sacrifice is for nothing. And that is why he's so angry. Gin ends up being the first one to break. Sanji may be trying to preserve the Baradier a moment longer, but Gin is still trying to preserve Sanji. He owes Sanji his life and he's trying to repay the debt to him, but also honor his commitment to Krieg. So he fights, he tries to beat Sanji into submission, but again, the demon man cannot bring himself to land the final blow. Sanji's overflowing kindness has stopped the merciless battle commander in his tracks. He begs Don Krieg to spare them, to even leave the Baradier alone because he knows that if he continues to insist on taking it, Sanji will stand in his way to stop them. So we see him torn between his loyalty to Krieg and his debt to Sanji, even as Krieg rejects him and tells him to die and Luffy and Sanji tell him to ignore Krieg and think for himself, Gin rebuffs them. He says he deserves to die, that Krieg is a great man. How ironic that Sanji, ready to meaninglessly die when Zeph doesn't want him to in order to protect the Baratier, is trying to stop another person from meaninglessly dying because of the man that he serves. He just can't see it. Sanji's so kind, he can see the value in the life of someone like Gin, but he fails again and again to see the value in his own life. It culminates in the scene when the poison gas bomb begins to clear, and we see Gin forcing the gas mask onto Sanji's face, and Sanji's fighting him. It's come full circle. Sanji's forcefully having his life saved by a man whose life he saved at the cost of that man's life. But Sanji's life isn't the only one that Gin saved. He also saved Luffy's life. We've seen Luffy angry in the last arc with Kuro's murder of his own crew, 
But Luffy in this panel is both furious and fearful. Luffy hates that someone may have just died to save him. So he tells Gin, don't die. And he also tells him that he'll send Krieg flying. Luffy's had to retreat from Krieg's spike projectile attack before, but Gin's sacrifice has awoken something in Luffy. It's made him serious. So true to his word, he ignores the projectiles and the spiked cape and lands his first solid blow on Krieg. The fight is then truly on, and Luffy dismantles Krieg's arsenal outlined in the last part. All good stuff. Meanwhile, Sanji is watching. He's questioning how Luffy can continue on, and most of all, he wonders what drives Luffy to be like this. At the conclusion of the fight, Luffy falls into the water and Sanji dives in to rescue him, and as he drags Luffy back onto the Baradier, he reminisces, first of Zoro, then of Luffy, and then of himself, and how he was telling Zoro to give up. He's comparing himself to those two. He's identified what, at this moment, separates them from him. At the end of the story, we are shown two paths. First, we see Gin, despite having been rejected by Krieg, literally takes it upon himself to help Krieg achieve his dream. He hoists him on his shoulders, making the decision that, while Krieg may disagree, is the best choice for Krieg to succeed in the long run. He has come to the realization that, yes, he is still dedicating his life to this man in spite of it all. He has taken the path of absolute commitment to the man he's chosen to serve. He even says that he'll see them again on the Grand Line when previously he was so fearful of returning there. Gin has gone through his ordeal and has become more resolute to serve Don Krieg. He's become resolved to face his fear of the Grand Line for the sake of the man he serves. Has no dream of his own, rather Krieg's dreams have become his. And so, what path does Sanji take? Does he redouble his commitment to Zeph? First, when Luffy wakes up inspired by all these people recklessly chasing their dreams, Sanji divulges his dream of the All Blue to Luffy. And look at that smile. We haven't seen Sanji smile so brilliantly this whole arc. And Zeph can see that too. It's a little late, but it's time to bring up how Sanji, as well as the rest of the Baradier cooks, talk. I've heard it described in many different ways, but I'll throw my hat into the ring and say that the way they communicate is very Aussie. I totally understand and appreciate absolutely slagging the people you care about, so let's not get confused here. Sanji and Zeph really, really care about each other. So Zeph does all he can to stop Sanji. He's insulted Sanji in half-hearted attempts to make him leave, but he goes all out here. He respects Luffy and thinks that he's the type of person to help Sanji pursue his dream, so he breaks his ideals, Zeph wastes food, and he lays his hands on Sanji. He can't communicate with Sanji honestly, he's so used to hiding how he feels about Sanji he can only try and forcefully push him away. He's trying to sell Sanji in this terrible don't be honest about your feelings way that he needs to go out and see the world, he needs to expand his vision, but all that comes out is you'll never be able to cook like me. I've cooked on all the oceans of the world. But as soon as Sanji is out of the room, Zeph is able to speak honestly to Luffy. And it's a softer, gentler Zeph that Sanji overhears that gives Sanji the final push that he needs. All the insults of not needing Sanji, not wanting him, saying that he's a bother, all of that has never worked. But Sanji hearing and understanding that Zeph wants him to follow his dreams, that Zeph cares about his dreams, about him, that's what Sanji needed to hear. Of course, Sanji plays it cool. His stoicism turned up full blast. Look at his face here. He's just said he's going to pursue his dream and join Luffy's crew. This should be a triumphant and celebratory moment, but it's rendered as if Sanji just threatened to take Luffy's life. He exchanges his usual sarcasm with the cooks and Zeph and well, it's time to leave. Only at the last possible moment does Zeph finally let it slip. And what does Zeph call the boy who he's raised all these years? Sanji. Keep your feet dry. It's not baby eggplant. Zeph has finally called Sanji by name. And Sanji, poor, passionate Sanji, finally breaks his stoic, tough guy facade in front of Zeph, and he too calls him by his name and his title, Chef Zeph. Sanji struggles to see the value in his own life. That's why he's been so willing to throw it away. And living with Zeph who communicates with insults probably hasn't helped that problem. It's probably the reason that Zeph saying that he's not needed has never worked. Sanji needs to feel valued, to feel cared about. 
That's why Zeph's showing that he cares about Sanji and his well-being, not hiding it behind layers of insults and stoicism, it cuts right down to Sanji's tender core. And I think now is the time to put Sanji's lack of self-worth in the chest. Sanji finally takes a different path. He has been freed of his servitude, but not his gratitude. He's been shown a way where, yes, he owes Zeph his life and he cares deeply for Zeph, but the best way to show his appreciation to Zeph is by living his life to the fullest, to pursuing his dream. Luffy was waiting for Sanji to make this decision. Luffy, since the beginning, knows what people need. He knew Zoro needed trust, that Nami needed mutual benefit, that Usopp needed respect. Sanji has been a tough nut to crack, but Luffy has recognized that there's nothing he can do for Sanji to get him on his crew. Sanji needs to make the decision himself, even if his hand takes a moment to catch up with his brain. So Luffy is ready to leave once he hears his crew needs him, ready to leave Sanji behind. When Sanji says he'll join him, Luffy hesitates for a moment. It's only when Sanji says that he'll chase his dream with Luffy and then ask permission to join, now Luffy celebrates. But he's not fully satisfied just yet. I think he can tell that something still needs to be said between Sanji and Zeph. So look at his little smile when Zeph tells Sanji to keep his feet dry. After Sanji has poured out his heart and thanks to Zeph, Luffy calls it. We're off, set sail, what's needed to be said has been said, now they can leave for the next adventure. And that's the story of Sanji, of Gin, and the future Pirate King. Though Sanji's story is still far from over. There's a lot of stuff he needs to deal with in the future. He may have managed to start pursuing his own dream, but that doesn't mean he fully sees the value in his own life just yet. Before we wrap up, let me throw in a few more bits. First, some extra Luffy moments. Luffy may be selfish, but as mentioned previously, he's got a strong sense of responsibility. The fact that he totally is ready to commit a year of working at the Baradier for something that he frankly wasn't responsible for is very admirable. Even if Luffy is so useless at so many things unrelated to fighting. And while Luffy is working, put that in the largest quotation marks you can find, it's sweet that he thinks of Kobe. It shows that though it's been a little while since they've parted ways, Luffy does fondly remember Kobe. I briefly mentioned it in the last part, but Luffy clearly doesn't interfere with his crewmates' dreams, even if it could mean their deaths. In Zoro's duel with Mihawk, Luffy is freaking out, but he knows that this duel is the most important thing in the world to Zoro, and he refuses to interfere or let others interfere. As a result, we see the blind panic that Luffy falls into when he thinks one of his crew members has been killed. Luffy is impulsive, he does what he wants, but this reaction is a first. It's emotional, and Luffy's reaction is reckless. Luffy's never been careful exactly when he fights, but this sort of emotional and thoughtless attack is a first. Let's throw that in the chest for later. Some of my favorite Luffy moments in this chapter is him sticking it to Krieg. When Krieg is bloviating about how strong he is and, haha, you see, aren't I suited to be the ruler of the seas? Luffy's just like, nah mate, you don't have what it takes. And especially his point of, you're not strong, there's just a lot of you. Probably a point better suited for the last video, since Luffy is directly going against Krieg's perception of things being strength, but still worth the mention, and it's hilarious. Also, I forgot to throw Zoro's commitment to not accept death anymore in the chest last episode, so thank you Naviro for reminding me, so I'll throw it in now. And with that, we wrap up the Baradier. Hang on, editing Blobbit here, editing less than 9 hours before this video is meant to go live, and I realize I missed something. So let me speed out this section. I forgot to go through the world building and the themes. How could I? So, world building. A lot of this relates to the last part, but we learn a lot. First from Mihawk, we learn the four seas and that the East Blue is apparently the weakest. We learn about a place called the All Blue, where these four seas apparently meet. We technically learn about pirate armadas. We hadn't seen any up to this point. We see another naval rank in full body. We get an expansion on the Grand Line as being somewhere that people pursue at their dreams. Very importantly, we get to take a glimpse at the power ceiling in One Piece through Mihawk, though it's definitely the case that everyone else around him is so weak that we've barely scratched the surface of the upper echelons of strength in the series. We get to see the wide variety of types of ship there are, as well as size. We see a tiny Mihawk ship and a massive Krieg ship, but the fact that the Baradier has mechanical components to it with its fins and detachable head is probably the more important thing seeing the wild functionality that ships can potentially have. 
I'm also going to point out that this is the first mention of disease. Yosaku catching scurvy does tell us that in a world building sense that you do in fact need good nutrition and that the very real disease scurvy is part of the pirating equation. But outside of those nasty anime colds that show up in every manga, it's rare for a fantasy adventurous shonen to really talk about disease. So from this point on, disease as a dangerous concept have officially been introduced in One Piece and we'll learn that that's far more important a fact than we'll realize right now. Speeding on to themes. The largest and most important theme of dedicating yourself to someone or something and what that means is a large part of this arc through Sanji, through Gin, through Zoro's duel with Mihawk. Um, then there's the theme specific to what it means to be a cook. We've talked about both this video, there's the theme covered last video of things and how Krieg's reliance on things is what caused him to fail against Luffy. Then there are the East Blue themes, both of which are present this arc of personal treasure and dreams. And it's not an arc without the classic Luffy liberation loop. He not only liberates the Baratier from Krieg's tyranny, but he inspires Sanji and helps liberate him from his mental chains that kept him from pursuing his dream. Anything else while I'm recording this insert? Uh, Luffy's reaction to seeing the mechanical component of the Baratier, I guess? That is something we see a lot later on when it comes to robots. I think that's it. Resume the original recording. If all things go according to plan, there's only four more parts left. So I'm going to pull an odor and take a break next video to give myself time to prepare. I've got something in the works for the final part and I'll need some focus time to work through it. Expect a much more relaxed video in two weeks, though I'll keep doing the chapter reviews of course, and then it will be time to tackle our long park. So thank you once again for watching, I appreciate the comments and the feedback you all leave me every week. From the chest to the reminders, I always want to acknowledge however I can how you make these videos better. Since after all, it's not I attempt new things, it's we attempt new things. Thank you for watching and I hope you have a fruitful day.